Hi, and welcome back to the fourth video about the security of quantum key distribution. Today, as I promised, we will talk about entropies. But we won't talk about quantum entropies, actually. I decided to dedicate a whole video to classical information and entropies, because this is a topic that physics students are usually not exposed to. But in my opinion, learning about the ideas and the intuition behind classical entropies and classical information theory is a great help when you want to understand quantum entropies and understand why certain definitions are chosen the way they are. So this is why today everything will be classical and we'll learn a lot about classical entropies that will help us later to quantize these mathematical quantities. The study of classical information theory was basically kicked off by Shannon in 1948, where he published a paper that was called A Mathematical Theory of Communication. In this paper, he was asking two very fundamental questions about information. The first one was, how much bits are required to reliably compress a given amount of information? So if you have some sort of information, for example, a sentence in the, in the English language, then there is a lot of redundancy within that sentence. You could, for example, remove all the vowels in the above question, and you would probably still be able to recover the original question from that compressed data you have. And Shannon wanted to know how much bits do we minimally have to use to store a given amount of information such that we can later recover it with a probability of error that is arbitrarily small. The second question he was asking was how much information can be reliably transmitted through a given communication channel. So you want to know like if Alice and Bob want to communicate with each other over a classical channel how much information can they send through the channel, like for example, per channel use? Okay, so these are the two questions that motivated the study of information. But before you can answer these questions, you have to answer an even more fundamental question. And that is, how do we mathematically describe information at all? How do I know how much information there is within some sort of data that I have. Okay, so let's start with answering, answering this question. So when we talk about information, we often talk about random variables. This is some terminology from probability theory. <clears throat> and for the use of this video, you only have to know the following things about a random variable. So every random variable comes with an alphabet that we usually denote curly X. And this alphabet consists of realizations of the random variable. For every realization, we have a probability distribution that tells us how likely it is that this realization appears. So, for example, a random variable could describe a coin flip that we make. For a coin flip, the alphabet consists of heads and tails. And if it is a fair coin, then the probability that heads appears is one half. And also the probability that tails appears is one half. So as you see, random variables, they model random experiment, experiments. Yeah. So Every sort of experiments that you can make that has some sort of randomness to it is modeled by a random variable. For example, a coin flip. Suppose that we have flipped the coin one time and got the outcome head. So we've just learned one realization of the random variable. But how much information did we get from this one random experiment that we just did? The information content of a particular realization of the random variable is given by minus the logarithm of the probability that the realization occurs. Note that here and throughout the whole video, logarithms are always taken to base 2. Below you can see a plot of the information content function as a function of the probability. 
And we will now have a look at the properties of this function to justify that we use it to quantify the information content of a realization of the random variable. So let's keep it here so we can always see what the function is. And the first thing that I want to mention is that the information content only depends on the probability of the event and not on how we have labeled the event. So suppose you have some alphabet x1 that includes one, uh, 0 and 1, and 0 has the probability 1 over 4, and 1 has the probability 3 over 4. On the other hand, consider an alphabet that's labeled plus and minus, but with probabilities 1 over 4 for plus and probability 3 over 4 for minus. So the probabilities are the same as above, only the labels are different now. Intuitively, we would want that the information that we get by learning about the, the value 0 should be the same as the information that we get by learning about the value plus, because they are distributed with the same probabilities. And as the information content function is only a function of the probability of the events, this is exactly how it behaves. So the information content of the realization 0 is 2, and the information content of the realization plus, which has the same probability as zero, is also true. The second property is that the function is continuous in the parameter p. So this is also something that is, makes sense intuitively, because if the probability of some event only slightly differs from another event, then also the information content of this event should only slightly differ from the information content of the other event. <clears throat> the third property is that the information content is high for unlikely events and it is low for events that are more common. This is something that you can see directly from the graph that is plotted there. So as the probability approaches one, events are very common. So the information content is quite low. You can also think about the information content as the, the amount of surprise that we have when learning about the realization. So if some realization is very uh, common, it occurs almost all the time, then we are not very surprised to see this realization. But if the probability of the realization is only 0.01, then we would be very surprised to see this realization appear. And so the information content is very high, as you can see in the plot. The fourth property is that the information content is an additive function. OK, so when we have, when we have two realizations of our random variable, then we usually assume that two instances of the random variable are independent of each other. So the first realization that we get does not depend on the second realization that the information source outputs afterwards. This is reflected in the fact that the probability distribution that tells us uh, how likely pairs of events are uh, factors into probability distributions for single events. And if our information source behaves in this way, then the information content of learning about a pair of realizations should be the same as the information content of learning about the events individually. And this is reflected in the calculation you can see here. So the information content of learning about the pair of realizations x1 and x2 it is given by minus the logarithm of the probability that this pair appears. And as I said before, because our source two uses of this information source are independent of each other, this probability distribution factors. And yeah, because the logarithm is uh, additive, we in the end have the sum of the information contents of the individual realizations. OK, but this is only the information content of a single realization. 
what we would also be interested in is the information content of the whole random variable. And this is defined as the entropy of a random variable. So it is usually called Shannon entropy after Shannon who introduced it. And the entropy of a discrete random variable x with probability density px of x is given by minus the sum of the logarithm of the probabilities um, of the individual realizations times the probability of the realization. And we sum over all the possible realizations that are within the alphabet of the random variable. Here, you can see we get into trouble when the probability of some event is zero because the logarithm of zero goes to minus infinity. But we use the convention that zero times the logarithm of zero equals zero because intuitively, when the probability is zero, then this um, is an event that will never occur. And we don't want an event that never occurs um, contribute to the entropy of the random variable. It is further justified by the mathematical fact that if you have epsilon times the logarithm of epsilon and you let epsilon go to zero, then that equals zero. <clears throat> okay, so with the definition of the Shannon entropy, we can now go on and answer the first question that Shannon raised in his paper from 1948. The question was, how much bits are required to reliably compress a given amount of information? And the answer to this question is simply the Shannon entropy of the random variable that models the random experiment that you perform. This is covered by Shannon's noiseless coding theorem. And to understand this a bit better, we will have a look at an example. So suppose you have a random variable that has four possible outcomes, which we denote A, B, C, and D. They are distributed according to the above probability distribution, where A occurs with probability 1 half, B occurs with probability 1 over 4, and C and D both occur with probability 1 over 8. A very simple compressing scheme is then the following. You could just use two, uh, two bits and encode the four letters according to the four probabilities of choosing those bits, which is we encode A as 0, 0, B as 0, 1, C as 1, 0, and D as 1, 1. The expected length of a code word is then 2, because the length of every code word in the scheme is 2. But the question is, can we do better than that? So according to Shannon, there is some compressing scheme where the expected length of a code word equals the entropy of the random variable. Well, let's calculate the entropy of the random variable. <clears throat> According to the, the formula for the entropy, we can just put in the probabilities and as a result, we get seven over four. Well, seven over four is less than two. So apparently there is a scheme where the expected length of a code word is less than two. What we can do is do the following more clever scheme, which is also known as variable length coding. So those letters, those outcomes that occur with a high probability are encoded with a short code word. And those outcomes that occur with a small probability get longer code words. So here we have chosen to encode A with 0, B with 1, 0, C with 1, 1, 0, and D with 1, 1, 1, 0. And the expected length of these code words, well, just using the formula to calculate that, we get exactly 7 over 4, which is the entropy of the random variable. So that also means that we cannot do better. If we want to be able to reliably uh, decode the the messages that we send, then this is the minimum amount of 
um, of bits that we can use to encode the symbols. Of course, you could use shorter code words like encode B also with a with a single bit, just one, and use shorter code words for C and D also, but then you wouldn't be able to reliably decode the message. <clears throat> so this is the best that we can do, and it matches exactly Shannon's theorem. Okay. Another interesting example of, uh, of the entropy is the binary entropy. This is when you have an outcome set with only two outcomes, we denote them zero and one here, which are distributed according to the probability distribution where zero occurs with probability P and one occurs with probability one minus P because they have to sum up to one. Then the binary entropy, if we just put in these probabilities into the entropy formula, is denoted by minus p log p minus 1 minus p log 1 minus p. And this entropy is such an important example that occurs um, in a lot of cases that it got its own name and its own um, letter to denote. So if we plot this function as a function of the parameter p, then it looks like this. As you can see, it uh, reaches its maximum when the probability is one half. <clears throat> okay, if you um, think about this binary entropy, for example, as the model of a coin flip, then P equal to one half is a, a fair coin. So by using a fair coin, we are the most surprised by the events. Because if the coin is biased, then, for example, one or heads occurs with probability uh, 90%, then we wouldn't be very surprised to see this uh, event occur. And also, we wouldn't get so much information from it. Okay, so after we have now seen some examples of entropies and how the entropy of a random variable is computed, we will have a closer look at some mathematical properties of the entropy function. The first property that we have a look at is that the entropy is non-negative. So if you look at this formula for the entropy and you remember that this actually corresponds to a sum over the information content that we defined in the beginning and which is depicted uh, above here, <clears throat> then we have a sum over the information content weighted by the probability of the realization. And the information content is a positive function, which you can see in the uh, plot above. So if we weigh it by with positive weights, then we should get a positive function out of that. The next mathematical property is that the entropy is invariant and the permutations of the realizations of the random variable. This is just a, um, this just follows from the fact that the entropy function only depends on the probabilities of the realizations and not on the value of the realization itself. The third property is that the entropy vanishes if and only if x is a deterministic variable. Intuitively, this makes sense because if x is a deterministic variable, then we do not learn anything by seeing an outcome of x because we always know in advance which outcome it will put out. <clears throat> but we can also prove this mathematically from the formulas that we have. So the first direction is suppose the entropy vanishes. In that case, the, um, the, the individual terms in the sum have to be zero for every realization that can occur. <clears throat> and these, that this term only equals zero, either if the probability of the event is zero or if the probability of the event is one, because then we have the logarithm of one, which equals zero. 
but we also have the requirement that the sum over the probabilities equals one. So the only possibility is that there's exactly one value x0 for which the probability is equal to one and the probability of all the other realizations is zero. And this is exactly what a deterministic variable is. So the value x1 will always occur. The other direction is that we say x is deterministic. That means that our probability distribution is given by a delta function of x and x0. So it is one exactly when x equals x0 and zero otherwise. If we put this probability distribution into the formula for the entropy, then as you can see, the only term in the sum is that, uh, that we have is minus the logarithm of one and this equals zero. So the entropy vanishes. The last property that I want to mention is that the maximum value of the entropy is given by the logarithm of the cardinality of the alphabet. So if we have four outcomes, then the maximum entropy is the logarithm of four. Um, equality for this formula holds if and only if x is a uniform random variable. So we have a uniform probability distribution for it. I want to prove this here but it um, follows from the fact that the so-called relative entropy between two probability distributions is a non-negative quantity. Okay, so now we have seen um, several mathematical properties of the entropy function. Now we want to go a step further and have a look at some variations of the entropy function. The first one that we want to consider is the so-called uh, conditional entropy. And this occurs in the following scenario. So suppose we have two parties, Alice and Bob, and Alice holds some uh, random experiment that is described by the random variable x. In the beginning where Alice has this random experiment and Bob has no knowledge about it, his uncertainty about the random variable is given by the entropy of the random variable. <clears throat> Suppose now that Alex, Alice starts to send information to Bob. So she, she does her random experiment, she gets realizations of the random variable and she sends them over to Bob. So Bob gets information about the random variable x that we will denote y. So he doesn't get the, the whole random variable x, but he gets some side information about it. So now his uncertainty about x is the entropy of x conditioned on the side information y that he got. Okay, how do we mathematically define this, uh, this conditional entropy? We start by defining the entropy of the random variable x conditioned on one particular realization of the random variable y. This is given by the, the sum over all the realizations of x, um, where we have terms with the, the conditional probability of x given y times the logarithm of this conditional probability. So the conditional probability that we have here it tells us what the probability is that a realization x appears given that a realization y has also already occurred or will occur. So we know about this realization y and conditioned on this knowledge that we have, we want to know what the probability is that a realization x appears. Okay, and the conditional entropy is then defined as the sum of all these, um, these entropies that we defined above, where we only had one realization, one realization of y, and weigh it by the probability that this realization small y occurs. We can then do some, uh, some math. And in the, the last step that we do uses the fact that 
the conditional entropy of y condition of um, x condition on y times the probability distribution over y equals the so-called joint probability distribution the, that you can see in the last line. So the joint probability distribution just tells you, in case you have two random variables, what the probability is that a pair x, y occurs. <clears throat> okay, how does it relate to the the margin entropy of the random variable x that we have defined before. Well, conditioning does not increase the entropy of a random variable. So the entropy of a random variable x is always greater or equal to the entropy of the random variable conditioned on some side information x. I will not prove this fact here, but intuitively, if you remember the picture we had before, that Alice holds the random variable x, and Bob holds some side information y about the random variable, then h the entropy of the random variable x um, represents his uncertainty about Alice's random variable bef before he got any information, and the conditional entropy is his uncertainty about the random variable x after he gained some information. So this should only decrease. Okay, I have already mentioned the so-called joint probability distribution of two random variables. And using this joint probability distribution, we can also define a joint entropy. So the joint entropy is very similar to the original entropy formula. Just now we re replaced the probability distribution of a single random variable with the joint probability distribution of two random variables. Um, I've already also mentioned that the joint probability distribution of two random variables x and y is equal to the conditional probability distribution of x conditioned on y times the probability distribution only over x. And if we insert this formula into the formula for the joint entropy, like we did here, then we can split up the logarithm into two sums. And in this step, we have also used the fact that if you have a joint probability distribution over x and y, and you sum over all the realizations of y, then what you get is the uh, margin probability distribution only over x, which leads to the formula that you can see on the left. And as you have probably already detected it, these, um, these sums, correspond to the entropy of the random variable x plus the entropy, the, the conditional entropy of the random variable y conditioned on x. Instead of using the formulas that you can see here above, you could also use slightly different versions of them where you replace you always replace x and y. So these formulas, they are symmetric in x and y and you can use the, the other version. And in that case, you get that the joint, uh, the joint entropy is equal to the entropy over y plus the conditional entropy of x conditioned on y. So the joint, pro the joint entropy is symmetric in x and y. We can now define another quantity, which is the mutual information of two random variables. So if you have two random variables, x and y, that have some joint probability distribution p, then the mutual information of these two random variables is defined as the entropy of x minus the conditional entropy of x conditioned on y. So intuitively, you can think of this in the following way. Remember that the entropy of x denotes the uncertainty you have about the random variable x. And the conditional entropy of x conditioned on y denotes the uncertainty that is left about x after you have learned about y. So the, the difference between these two quantities should exactly be the mutual information of these two random variables, because it represents everything that you can learn about x from y. 
Okay, with this reasoning, it also makes sense that we could equally define the mutual information to be the entropy of the random variable y minus the conditional entropy of y conditioned on x. In a minute, we will see a picture of that, which also makes this a bit more clear. But first, I want to mention that the mutual information is always a non-negative quantity. It is easy to see this from the above formula because we have already seen that h of x minus so that uh, h of x is greater or equal than h of x condition on y, which means that the mutual information automatically is non-negative. Okay, now let's have a look at this picture that combines several of the entropies that we have already seen. So the green circle on the left side denotes the entropy of x. So this is the, the uncertainty that we have about x before we learn about it, or um, stated differently, it is the information that x contains that we can learn about. On the other hand, here we have the entropy of y, it's the blue circle on the right, which denotes the information that um, y contains. So in this sense, the overlap between the two circles is the mutual information of x and y. It is the information that we could either learn from learning about x or from learning about y. And now, you see here that the conditional information, let's start with the conditional information of x condition and y on the left side, it is exactly the information or the, the entropy of x minus this part here where the overlap is, so minus the mutual information. And the same thing holds for the right side with the, um, the entropy of y. And the, the area that is covered by both of the circles is then the joint entropy of the random variables x and y. So this is the picture that we have in mind when x and y are somehow statistically dependent. So it is possible to learn something about x from learning about y. In the case that x and y are statistically independent, the picture looks a bit different. In that case, these two circles are disjoint sets, because if x and y are statistically independent of each other, there is no mutual information. We cannot get any information about x from learning the outcomes of y. So this is why the mutual information here in the middle is outside of every circle and is zero in this case. Also, what you can see from this picture is that the entropy of x conditioned on y is equal to the entropy of x because learning any value of y does not decrease our uncertainty about the uh, entropy of x and the same holds for the conditional entropy of a y conditioned on x on the right side the joint entropy is still the union of these two circles only that now these are disjoint sets and in this case, when these are disjoint sets, then the joint entropy is just the product of the individual entropies. Okay, this leads us to the final question that we want to answer in this talk, which I raised in the beginning but have left unanswered so far. There was, how much information can be reliably transmitted through a given communication channel? And after we have seen all these different entropies and informations, we can now answer this question. So consider this, the following scenario where Alice holds a random variable x and she communicates to Bob over a classical channel n. And by doing this communication, Bob gets uh, information that is represented by a random variable y. Okay, so the, the largest number of bits that Alice can reliably transmit over this channel is given by the capacity. And the capacity is given by the mutual information between the random variable x and y. 
maximized over the probability distributions over x. So, of course, when Alice sends realizations of x over to Bob, she can um, choose them according to some probability distribution. But the capacity of the channel should not depend on the probability distribution that Alice chooses. So we maximize over all the possible probability distributions. And then this capacity tells you what the largest number of bits is that you can send per use of the channel. OK, so now we have answered both of the questions that Shannon raised and also answered in his paper about classical information. We come to the end of this video. We have learned a lot about classical information theory and about classical entropies. So we are well prepared for next time where we'll talk about quantum entropies and we will see the quantum versions of lots of the classical entropies that we have seen in this video. So I hope you have liked this video. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you next time.